this time, Brother Buffin, if you'll come. We love you, brother. Thank you, brother. Well, good evening. It's good to be back with you tonight, be in the Lord's house and open his word uh, tonight. If you will, open to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, uh, two Wednesday nights ago, I believe it was, we looked at the first nine verses of Ephesians chapter 1. We're going we're gonna to look at the rest of the chapter tonight, verses 10 through 23 of Ephesians chapter 1. I would like to start by reading the whole chapter. The Word of God is what is powerful. My words are not powerful. Amen. The Word of God is powerful, and it is true and it is sufficient, and it is all that we need. So let's, let's read God's word tonight. Ephesians chapter 1, we'll read the whole chapter. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ." In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance, until the redemption of the purchased possession, unto the praise of his glory. Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus, and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who to believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, and hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. So I ask the Lord's blessing on his word. Lord God, we bow once again before you tonight. We bow as people who are in need of you we are in need physically, spiritually, emotionally, uh, financially, uh, Lord, in, in every way we need you. We do not depend upon ourselves. We do not depend upon men or upon governments or upon anything in our lives, Lord, except the Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank you for your word and how you speak to us. And we pray that you would do that tonight, that your word would go out with power, uh, Lord, that it would not be my words, but it would be the word of God that is spoken that your spirit would be here with us tonight and move among us, uh, both on those who may be here and lost and those of us who are saved by your grace. Would you move on us, Lord, in a mighty way? We ask you to do a work in our hearts and our minds through your word. And so would you bless us now that we might be to the praise of the glory of Jesus Christ. 
So Ephesians uh, chapter 1, we talked uh, about several uh, opening comments about Ephesians last time. Uh, Ephesians, of course, written by the Apostle Paul uh, around A.D. 60. It's one of the prison epistles that he wrote while he was in prison at Rome. And he's writing, obviously, in verse 1, he tells us, to the saints which are at Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Uh, so I questioned myself, could that, is that written to me? Am I the faithful in Christ Jesus? That, that's what I want to be. That's what I should be. Amen. Could I truly call myself the faithful in Christ Jesus? Certainly this is by extension written to us as well to read in God's word today. Uh, one thing I didn't mention last time, if, if you read Ephesians before, you notice Ephesians is neatly divided kind of in two halves, the first three chapters and the last three chapters, the first three chapters being doctrine, theology that, that Paul has given us in the last part of this book being practicality, the practical nature of our, of our Christian walk. Uh, but that's not to say that the first three chapters have nothing practical to say to us. Every message that we hear, we should be asking ourselves, what, what does God want me to do with this? These are not just flowery words that God has given us. He's given us commands. He's given us things that he wants us to take heed of uh, and to do. They have practical application for our lives. Uh, one thing that I mentioned last time, it seems, especially in this first chapter, that Paul was enjoying a time of praise and worship while also giving a theology lesson at the same time. He was praising and he was worshiping and he is honoring the Lord over and over again. Uh, we see this, this phrase, to the praise of his glory, to the praise of his glory over and over again. Paul is just worshiping the Lord. But he's also, also masterfully weaving together doctrine and theology at the same time as he is praising and worshiping the Lord. Uh, and I thought about, and we discussed somewhat last time, shouldn't that be every worship service? that we're in, weaving those two things together. Uh, not, just, not just being theologically correct, we should be theologically correct, but not just theologically correct at the expense of any emotion that's unbalanced. But we should also not be, uh, we should not be very shallow in our theology while being ruled by our emotions. There's a balance there between, between those two things. And I heard a preacher one time say, he, he was talking about ditches, he said, there are two ditches on many subjects in the Word of God, two ditches we could be in. And he pointed out, if you can only see one ditch, it's probably because you're in the other one. <laughs> there are two ditches that we could be in. So we want to be on the road that God has given us. We want to be, as Paul here, worshiping the Lord passionately, while at the same time honoring Him biblically, uh, speaking of Him truthfully or accurately, and fearing Him reverently. We want to do all of those things at the same time. Uh, I fear sometimes we give up uh, true worship at the expense of being doctrinally correct. And that's, not a, that's a ditch that we're in. Uh, we don't want to give up the worship, even the passionate worship of God. And yes, sometimes our emotions are involved in the passionate worship of God. We don't want to do away with emotion that God has given us. Yeah. To the praise of his glory. So Paul goes through some very specific reasons here, uh, and I'm not going to re-preach the message from two weeks ago, but he gives these specific reasons why he wants to praise and worship God, such as he's blessed us with all spiritual blessings. He's chosen us in him. He predestinated us unto the adoption of children. He made us accepted in the beloved. We have redemption through his blood. He's abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. And, and then in verse 9, where we left off last time, he praises him because he's made known unto us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure. And that brings us up to where I want to focus tonight, and that is 10, 10 through 23. Paul left off saying, he's made known unto us the mystery of his will. And we asked the question, question last time, well, well, what is his will? Some of us might say, well, I don't know what God's will is. He hadn't made known to me the mystery of his will. I'm not sure what his will is. But he tells us in his book, we have his book, uh, and that is the mystery of his will. And Paul would say, well, his will is uh, that he would choose a people before the foundation of the world. That's his will. His will is that he would bless them with all spiritual blessings, that they would be holy and without blame before him. In love and all of these things that he just got done praising God for, that is God's will. Uh, that is God's will because he accomplished that will. And it kind of ties right together with verse 10 when he says, That in the dispensation of the fullness, fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ. 
And so we'll kind of break this last uh, half of the chapter up into three sections, and the first being the mystery revealed in verses 10 through 12. That phrase, in the dispensation of the fullness of times, we see similar phrases uh, throughout the Bible, especially in the New Testament, where he says, in the fullness of time, in the dispensation of the fullness of time. What, what does he mean by that? In my words, I might say he means in God's own good timing. When God gets good and ready to do something, that's when he will do it. At the precise time that God wills, everything happens on God's timetable, not, to, not mine. I would like it to happen on mine. <laughs> that's what I would like in my flesh, it to happen on my timetable. But it doesn't. It happens on God's timetable. And I remember uh, one of the things that my grandfather used to say is when something didn't go exactly right or exactly how we might want it to go, he would say, God is still in control, he's still on his throne, and everything is right on schedule. And I thought that was a good saying. Everything's right on schedule, on God's schedule, that is, uh, not on mine. So in the dispensation of the fullness of times, what? He might gather together in one all things in Christ. Uh, this Greek phrase here, gather together in one, it could also be phrased, sum up under one head. Jesus Christ being that head, to sum everything up under one head, the head of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is putting all things under his feet. It tells us later on in verse 22, he hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church. All things. He put all things under his feet. Not just religious things. He put all things under his feet. All governments, all economies, all families, all marriages, all children, all people, all things have been put under the feet of Christ. He is gathering up, he is summing up under one head, all things. He is head over all things, not just religious things. He is head over all things. And what is he head to? It says here, he is head over all things to the church. In other words, to those who hope in Christ, he is the head over all things. Now, I want to clarify that Christ is certainly Lord over all things, whether you are saved or unsaved. He is Lord. I do not make him Lord. He is already Lord. Amen. He is Lord over all things. But in a special and more particular way, he is head over all things to the church, yes. to the saved. He is head over all things. Yes. Church and marriage and family and finances and, and history and science and politics and principalities and powers and our health, and every other area of our life. He is Lord over all of these things. One commentary that I read said, God's purpose is to sum up the whole creation in Christ. Everything is summed up in the Lord Jesus Christ. When you add it all up, it's under the headship of the Lord Jesus Christ. That means Jews and Gentiles and slaves and free and male and female and rich and poor, and black, and white, and red, and yellow, things on earth, things in heaven, everything is summed up in the Lord Jesus Christ. Galatians 3 tells us there is neither Jew nor Greek. Amen. There's neither bond nor free. There's neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. He has summed us all up under the Lord Jesus Christ. And then in Colossians 1, uh, 20, it says, having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven, we are brought under the banner of Christ by his blood. We are all brought together under the banner of Christ by the blood of his cross. We may have differences. We likely do have differences in this congregation tonight and with other people that we meet. We have differences. We have different likes and dif dislikes. We have different families different jobs, different hobbies, different preferences, different backgrounds that we came from. It's true that we do have differences, but if we're saved, we have the most important thing in common, the Lord Jesus Christ and his shed blood on the cross of Calvary. And that brings us together in one under his banner. On to verse 11. Verse 11 says that we have obtained an inheritance. We've obtained an inheritance what do you do to earn an inheritance? 
you don't do anything to earn an inheritance, right? It's the one giving the inheritance that out of his good pleasure has given you or I that inheritance. In fact, we can't do anything to, to earn the inheritance. We have obtained an inheritance not by our good works, but by the blood of Christ. And if you are to obtain that inheritance, if you are lost tonight and you are obtain, to obtain that inheritance, it will be by the blood of Christ. What is that inheritance that he speaks of? I think there's a present inheritance. There's also an eternal inheritance. The present inheritance is we have fellowship with the Father through the blood of the Son and the Spirit of the Holy Spirit. We have fellowship with the Father. Right now, today, we can have that. We don't have to wait until we get to heaven. We can have that fellowship today with him. But there is also an, an eternal inheritance that we have inherited. First Peter 1 puts it like this, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, and it's reserved in heaven for us. He has reserved that inheritance for us there. Fellowship now, eternal life with him in the future. He has given us an inheritance, and no one can take away that inheritance. It will never be taken away from me. I'm et eternally secure in that inheritance. Also in verse 11, he says, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. This inheritance that I spoke of has been predestinated. It has been, it has been predetermined. It has been decided beforehand. Before I was ever born, it was decided that I would have this inheritance and it cannot be taken away. It is a present reality. It is a necessity. It is a sure thing in my life. It's not a maybe. It's not a, a hope so. This inheritance is a sure thing. It was predestinated. It was decided beforehand, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. And notice how this predestination happened, the predestination of this inheritance, by the counsel of his own will. God counseled with himself. He didn't ask anyone else's opinion on this he counseled with himself he did not look down through time and base his love on me on something I would or would not do because I'm certain that if he did that he would not have loved me he would not have loved me that is not what he did uh, one, one preacher that, that I heard preaching on the, this passage said his love was self originated I like that phrase it was self originated his love didn't come from outside of himself in some way. He did not look at me and say, I wonder if I want to love him or not based on his actions. It originated in himself in eternity past. It was self-originated. He did not ask anyone else's opinion. He counseled with himself in eternity past and predestinated those who would be saved based solely on his good pleasure and the counsel of his own will. Amen. Nothing outside of himself. Why did he do that? Verse 12 tells us this phrase that I mentioned earlier, that we should be to the praise of his glory Amen. who first trusted in Christ. You know, everything that God does, he does for his own glory. Mm -hmm. That is the ultimate reason that he does everything that he does. At times, I would say even many times, we are the beneficiaries of his actions. We benefit from his from his goodwill, from his mercy, from his grace. We benefit over and over again. Our, our cups overflow with the benefits. Um, it, it says he daily loadeth us with benefits. We're just loaded down with benefits. That is true. But ultimately, he does not make decisions for me. He makes decisions for himself and for his own glory and honor. That is why he makes decisions. In, in Isaiah 48, 9 through 11, it says, For my name's sake will I defer mine anger. And for my praise will I refrain for thee, that I cut thee not off. Behold, I have refined thee, but not with silver. I have chosen thee in the furnace of affliction. For mine own sake, even for mine own sake, will I do it. For how should my name be polluted? And I will not, I will not give my glory unto another. Amen. He said, for my sake, for my own sake, for my own glory, this is why I am doing this. Uh, one book that I read on Ephesians 1, it said that the hinge upon which salvation turns is the glory of God's name. Amen. The hinge upon which salvation turns is the glory of God's name. When Israel's sins provoked the Lord to anger, he saved them for the sake of his own name. We just read that in Isaiah. He work, his works all aim at the goal that the world may know 
he is the Lord. God does not save believers for anything in them, but simply for the praise of his glory. If you read through the Old Testament, we see that phrase over and over again in the Old Testament, that they may know that I'm the Lord, that they may know that I am God Almighty, that they may know that I am the Lord. He says that over and over again. I'm doing this that you may know that I am the Lord and that I may receive the glory from it. Yes, God is loving and merciful and gracious and kind and true and tender. He, he is all of those things. But ultimately, the end of salvation is for the glory of his name. Amen. It is for the glory of his name. The mystery of God's will, will is revealed in his word. And ultimately, it culminates in the summing up under one head all things in Christ as we receive our inheritance and we live both now and eternally to the praise of of his glory. The mystery of God's will is revealed in his word. It's not revealed in any man outside of his word. If I ever tell you I know the mystery of God's will and I'm not getting it from his word, you should not believe what I'm telling you. The mystery of his will is revealed in his word, not in a man, not in any person. Verses 13 and 14 uh, talk about being sealed by the Spirit. Sealed by the Spirit is the second section here. Uh, 13, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. There seems to be a progression that I see indicated in this verse. It is hearing the word, believing on Christ, and being sealed by the Spirit. That is the pattern given in Scripture. In Scripture, Hear the word, believe on Christ, sealed by the Spirit, receive the Holy Spirit of God. Romans 10, 14 is familiar and says, How shall they call on him in whom, whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Though I believe wholeheartedly in election and predestination mentioned uh, in these verses here, it is in error to say that sinners can be saved without the word. Amen. The word is a necessity. Amen. They must hear the gospel of Christ. I know some say, if you're predestinated, if you're elected, it doesn't matter whether you ever hear the gospel of Christ, you, you will be saved. I do not believe that. Amen. You must hear the gospel of Christ. Amen. You must repent of your sins and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes. The gospel is a necessity. Yes. It is through the fool foolishness of preaching of the word that God said he would save sinners. In 1 Corinthians 1. For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Amen. That's what God said. I will save through the foolishness of preaching. Verse 14. The Spirit is the earnest of our inheritance, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. There's that phrase again. And earnest is a, is a pledge or it's a, it's a promise, a down payment indicating that the full amount will be subsequently paid. Uh, most of us have purchased a house in here and many times you'll put down a down payment and earnest money indicating I want this house and this money indicates that I'm serious about this and, and I plan to purchase the house. Certainly Christ paid the full debt for our pardon on the cross. It wasn't just a down payment. However, the earnest of our inheritance, the Holy Spirit of God, was Christ saying, I will come back for my people. Amen. This is the earnest of my inheritance. I am leaving the comforter for them, and I will, I will come back one day to receive them to myself. Christ paid the full payment. If you are saved, you were bought with a price, the Bible tells us, and you were secured by the pledge of the Holy Spirit. So what is the role of the Spirit? This is one role. It is a seal. It is a pledge. The Holy Spirit comforts us. He guides us into all truth, the Scripture says. He illuminates the Word. He convicts of sin, provides wisdom and understanding, and He bears witness that we are the children of God, Amen. the Holy Spirit. Thank God that He has given us the seal and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. The last section of verses here, verses 15 to 23, is Paul's prayer for the Ephesian church. And I believe we can apply this to us today as well. In verse 15, he says, Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. Paul had heard of the faith of the Ephesians and of their love for the saints. He said, That's what stands out to me 
about the church at Ephesus. As I've traveled around to other churches, I've heard about you. Not I've heard about your bickering and your fighting, but I've heard about your faith and your love to all the saints. What a testimony to the church at Ephesus that Paul says, that's what I've heard about you. Everywhere I go, they talk about your faith and they talk about your love for the saints. Could that be said of us? Could that be said of me? Could that be said of this church? Could that be said of other churches? Yes, we've heard of you. We've heard of your faith and we've heard of your love for the saints. Or would they say, yes, we've heard of you. We've heard of your contentious spirit. We've heard uh, how mean and cruel you are. We've heard about all the gossips in your church. We've heard of your lack of love. We've heard of your lack of love and your knowledge of God's word. Yes, we've heard about those things. Or would they say we've heard of your faith and your love? And Paul says, because I've heard of these things, I cease not to give thanks for you. I thank the Lord that I've heard of your faith and your love. And I, cease, I don't cease to make mention of you in my prayers. And then he starts into this long list of reasons that he prays for them. And how specifically that he is praying for them. And so I would ask you tonight, do you pray specifically? Or, or do you pray simple pat prayers that we're really not sure if they're ever answered or not. Like, God, will you please bless me? Well, well bless me in what way? In what, how would I know if that was ever answered? Will you, will you bless, bless brother so-and-so? Will you help him? Help him in, in what way? Do we pray specifically for people, for their healing, for their financial healing, for their salvation, for needs in our own lives? Do we pray specifically? Paul did here pray specifically. Here are some things that he prayed for in verse 17. That the Father may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Uh, this word spirit here comes from pneuma, a current of air, a, a blast, a breeze. Paul says, I'm praying that God would breathe on you with wisdom, with revelation of himself in the knowledge of him. That's a prayer that, that I need. Wisdom revelation from God in the knowledge of Christ. And I wondered, why didn't he say, you know, church at Ephesus, you need to study harder. You need to read your Bible more. You just need to dig deeper and study harder. Those would have been okay things to say. We should read the scripture. We, st we should study hard. We should dig into it. But why did he say, I'm praying for the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him? I think he said that because he knew that the only way they would understand the scripture is by the Holy Spirit of God. When we open his word, the only way that I will understand it is if God opens my eyes to the word. That is the only way. And that's why he was praying that for them. And really the next verse as well in verse 18, he says a similar thing when he says that the eyes of your understanding would be enlightened. I'm praying for the spirit of wisdom and knowledge and I'm praying that your eyes would be enlightened. Enlightened to what? Enlightened to God's word. As, that as you open the scripture, you would understand that scripture and be willing to apply it. Number three in verse 18 also, he said, I'm praying for you, church at Ephesus, Ephesus, that you may know what is the hope of his calling. Of whose calling? Of Christ's calling. That you would know what is the hope of Christ's calling. Well, what is the hope of Christ's calling? Christ said that he came to seek and to save that which was lost. That's what he told us in the scripture. The hope of his calling is the hope of the gospel, the hope in the glory of the Father, the hope in the resurrection, the hope in his perfect life, the hope in his return again for his people. We have hope in him, and that is the hope of his calling. And Paul said, I want you to understand the hope of his calling, because if you understand the hope of Christ's calling, you will want to go out, you will want to witness to your neighbor and to people that you work with, and you will want to glorify and honor the Lord with your life if you really understand the hope of Christ's calling. Number four, he says in verse 18, that you may know the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Paul says, I really want you to know about this inheritance that I spoke of earlier. And I want you to know about the glory of this inheritance. Psalm 82, 8, it says, Arise, O God, judge the earth, for, the, for thou shalt inherit all nations. The glory of this inheritance is twofold. We have inher an inheritance. Christ also has an inheritance. Christ has inherited a people for himself. Literally, he has inherited the nations. He has inherited those that he bought salvation for. He has inherited 
uh, all nations, people from all nations and kindreds and people and tongues. That is Christ's inheritance, and he will receive that inheritance that he died for. Christ has inherited the nations. We have inherited Christ himself and eternal life through him. So that's why I say that that inheritance is twofold. And Paul said, I pray that you will know the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Number five, in verses 19 through 21, he says that you may know the exceeding greatness of his power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead. Paul said, I want you to know something about the power of God, and I am praying that God would reveal himself in power to you. In the power that, that he wrought in Christ when he raised Christ from the dead, in the power that he exercises in your life on a daily basis, Paul said, I am praying that God would make himself known in power in your life. We need to know about the power of God, and not just intellectually. We can read God's word and we can know intellectually about the power of God, but do you experience the power of God on a daily basis? Amen. And if not, I'll ask myself, why not? Why do we not? Are we not asking God, as Paul asked for the church at Ephesus here, are we not asking God, God, please show yourself in power in my life, in power saving souls of those that I love, in power working in this situation that to me seems impossible to fix? I don't know how this situation would ever be fixed. Do you all have any situations like that in your lives? Amen. We all do. Over and over again, we say, I don't know how this could ever be worked out. That's exactly the time that God will show himself in power in our lives if we will ask him to do that. He is not only powerful, he is all-powerful. He is power himself. He demonstrated his power when he raised Christ from the dead. He goes on here to say that his power is far above everything. It's far above all principalities and powers and governments and dominion and every name that is named. His name, his power is far above all of these things. As we come here to the end of uh, chapter 1 here in verses 22 and 23, verse 22, he says that you may know that God has exalted Christ and put all things under his feet. Church at Ephesus... I am, pray, I am praying that you would realize that you would know, not this intellectually, but you would really know that God has put all things under his feet. Again, even that impossible situation, even that impossible person in your life, he has put all things under his feet, even your financial situation, even the salvation of your children and your loved ones. He has put all things under Christ's feet. He is head over all of these things. And lastly, in first, verse 23, he's still praying here. Paul is praying, and he says that you may know that the church is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Paul says, I am praying these things for you. I, I don't cease to make mention of you in my prayers. I pray for you daily over and over again. And these are the specific things that I pray for you. In these verses, we've seen the mystery of God's will revealed, the seal of the Holy Spirit and Paul's prayer for the believers at the church at Ephesus. And it seems to me we hear Paul saying, I want to exalt the name of Christ. Now there's not a verse that says that in these verses, but I believe he is saying in what he said here, I want to exalt the name of Christ. And church at Ephesus, I want you to exalt the name of Christ. I want you to know about his glory. I want you to know about his power. I want to exalt Christ. I want you to be to the praise of his glory and I want to be to the praise of his glory church I am praying that you will catch a glimpse just a small glimpse of what God has shown me about the exalted Christ about our spiritual blessings about the riches of his grace about his glory about the redemption that we have through his blood about the Lord Jesus Christ and his forgiveness of sins about this inheritance about the earnest of our inheritance the Holy Spirit of God about the exceeding greatness and power of God about the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ Ephesians, I want you to get just a small glimpse of what God has shown me. Because if you do that, if you get a small glimpse of that, and this would go for us as well, if we get a small glimpse of God's glory, we will be on fire for him. We will be consumed by him and his word. We will want to worship him and praise him and honor him and use our lives for the glory and honor 
of his praise. I read this quote uh, two weeks ago, but it said, Grace fuels heartfelt praise. When we know the grace of God in our lives, we want to praise and we want to worship and we want to honor him with all that we are. I fear that many times our view of Christ is very small. That we serve, we serve this very small Christ. But that's not the Christ of the Bible. It's a Christ of our own imaginations. Because the Christ of the Bible is on his throne. He is ruling over all kingdoms and principalities. He is king of kings, and he is Lord of lords. He is the great I am, the Bible tells us. We need a new view of Christ. Not new in the sense of outside of Scripture. New in the sense of fresh in our minds. We need a fresh view of the Lord Jesus Christ. Too often Christ becomes commonplace, old news, dare I say boring in our lives. He's become old news to us. But as Paul prayed for the Ephesian church, Ephesian church, may I, may we pray these same things. Father, would you give me the spirit of wisdom and knowledge and understanding? Would you give me eyes of understanding that would be enlightened? Would you give me an understanding of the hope of his calling, of the riches of his glory? of how I am saved by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ? Would you allow me to know the exalted Christ more fully? Would you allow me to know that the church is his body and the fullness of him that filleth all in all? And that knowing these things, I would not just know them as mere facts, but I would be changed. My outlook on life would be changed. My outlook of the Lord Jesus Christ would be changed. I would see Christ afresh in my life and my life would be lived to the praise and glory of his name. If you are unsaved here tonight, you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ and the free pardon of sin, I point you to Christ, as Paul did here in Ephesians chapter 1. I point you to Christ. It is Christ. It is Christ who provided our way of salvation. It is Christ who provides all of these spiritual blessings. It is Christ who purchased our redemption on the cross of Calvary, that through his own blood we might be saved. Look to Christ tonight. He is the only way of salvation. Amen. If you are unsaved, he will save you here tonight. If you will repent of your sins and you will trust Christ as your Savior, Amen. he will save you tonight. Worship the Lord passionately. Honor him biblically. Speak of him accurately. Fear him reverently and, and live your life to the praise of his glory. Amen.